Thank you, choir. And you, glad that our Jesus who we serve tonight is wonderful. Ain't he wonderful? Can I get an amen? amen? All right, turn your hymn box. Remain standing. Turn your hymn box to number one. All hail the power of Jesus' name. That angels prostrate fall. Number one. Sing it out for the glory of the Lord tonight.
Praise the Lord, we have that crowned him. That Messiah reigning with, with his Lord, sitting by God's side tonight. That mediator for us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. The Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this congregation, Lord. We thank you for the members of this church, how faithful they are. Dear Lord, we just pray that the body of Christ will get even larger tonight. That maybe it's just one more soul, or many, numerous souls, will come to know you as their personal Savior tonight. Lord, we just pray for the sick of the land, those who are battling cancer. Dear Father, those who are shut in, who can't get out to the services. Lord, we just pray for them, have a healing. Put your hand of healing upon them, Lord, that they may get better, if it be thy will. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the persecuted church that they, are keep, they keep striving in the many parts of the, this world, Lord. They keep striving on for you. They don't give up hope. And Lord, as Christians, that is our duty not to give up hope and keep spreading the gospel to those who don't know it as yet. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray for Brother Steve as he brings the message tonight. Be with him. Just empty him and you, the Holy Spirit, just fill him and whatever is you want him to speak that will be brought forth clearly, precise to us. And maybe somebody be challenged tonight or so be saved. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray for every aspect of this service. We just laid all before you at the throne, at your great throne. And we thank you for that great throne. We ask all these things in your precious and worthy name. Amen. All right, we'll have right now a trio, He Leadeth Me. He leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought, oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or trouble see, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp. Thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur or repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis God's hand that leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, even death's go wave, I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. Faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. For by his hand he leadeth me. For by his hand he leadeth me. Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful number. And now we're going to give you all another chance to sing. Turn your redemptive songs to number 439. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. And if he ain't yours tonight, I hope you come to that knowledge and that, that, that want to know him tonight. Number 439. Rise as we sing.
Now we're going to have another selection, firm foundations, boundless love, then the choir, love grew where the blood fell, and then our brother Steve will come and bring the whatever the Lord has laid on his heart. the way that Jesus can. He proved his love for me when he died on Calvary. He gave his life for fallen man. His love, his love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love, his love is an endless love, that will last through all eternity. Jesus wants to love you. There is none above you. You are precious in His sight. He will never fail you. When the doubts assail you, He'll be with you day and night. His love is a boundless love and it reaches down and touches me his love, his love is an endless love that will last through all eternity his love, his love is a boundless love and it reaches down and touches me his love, his love is an endless love that will last through all eternity. His love, 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 his love is a boundless Jesus on the cross, the people cry. Looking on, a man would think it a tragedy. But what this It would break the chains of sin's captivity.
So Luke chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, and I'll begin reading, of course, in verse 12. Luke chapter 5 and verse 12 says the following, And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored or begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but to go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at that last verse, going to the priest, showing yourself, making an, making an offering so that he could fulfill the law of Moses. Last week we talked about this leper and, and what it was to be uh, caught in leprosy and how the rabbis of that day viewed the leper. We talked about how um, um, their social stigma would have put them totally away from everyone. Indeed, they had to, to live outside in the Old Testament. They had to live outside the camp of Israel and even in the times of Christ, uh, many years after, uh, after the law had been given, the leper was kept outside of residential areas, and, and how the Lord Jesus stood to let this leper come and approach him and, and not uh, throw rocks at him or get him to go away, and he just let this clump of rejected humanity crawl to him and beg to be healed. Now Jesus, representing God, God in the flesh, would show exactly the heart of God. Overwhelmed by this man's great need, he would show him mercy. And having perhaps reached down, touching him where, where he had never been touched for years because of his, his leprosy, Jesus would reach out and touch him and say, I am willing. You know, so many people today wonder who God is. So many people wonder if God could love me. I, I'm, I'm so awful. I've done so many things. I'm, I'm such an evil person. And you wonder how could God ever, ever want me. But I want you to read this carefully tonight. It says this man, totally full of leprosy. You could see his disease from a distance. Totally ostracized, sent away, held off from society. He would be the man God would touch. And if you tonight are in that situation and you say, oh, I'm so undone, I can't come to God, God would never want me, you are being lied to. God would reach out and touch that very person, and maybe he'll touch your life tonight. Maybe your life is in need of being touched tonight. And so we find that Jesus reached out and he said, I am willing. Oh, that tells you of the heart of God. God is so, so interested, so absolutely committed to handling the diseased of sin. He reaches out, touches him. Do you think he cried? Do you think he wept? Possibly so. We don't know it. The text doesn't say. But we do know this, that Jesus said in a few words, be cleansed. And immediately, not a week later, not a month later, but right then and there. How many of you have ever been to the doctor? You know what we usually say to you? If you waited a few days, you probably could have got be you would have gotten better without me. But since you're here, we'll give you something anyway. That's a trade secret. Nobody knows that, but that's what we say. In other words, it, it, it doesn't take a few good days for God to heal anyone. God reaches out and heals them, them right there. Then the Lord Jesus says to them this. He says, now listen, you go show yourself to the priest, and you make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. 
And that's the key. We're going to have to look tonight at what Moses commanded. And tonight, we're going to have four points about what Moses commanded. And each of them will help you understand the lesson of this particular incident. The first point is this. It's going to it all begin with P, and it's going to be in, involve the priest tonight, the priest of that day, the high priest of the Old Testament. You may or may not know that there was a, a group of individuals designated as priests to help draw men to God and draw God to men. And, and, and though that individual was the custodian, was the keeper, the interpreter of the law, and so he would help uh, the non-priest to, to come near to God by, uh, through, in, through circumstances like this curing of leprosy. Second P tonight will be uh, um, the provision that God made. What kind of provision God made to allow this unclean person who's now been rid of his leprosy to be ceremonially, religiously able to partake in the activities of Jewish religion. The third P is, is, is the process. There's an extensive process involved. And of course, the fourth P is the pronouncement. The pronouncement. So we have a lot to talk about tonight, and let's see how we can get going. As you know, he said, you go and show yourself as an, uh, and to the priest, make an offering. This will be a testimony to who? To the, to the priest themselves, to the one who's supposed to understand this stuff. You will actually bear testimony of what is actually happening. Now, it says in the text, if you turn to Leviticus chapter 14, that's the passage that Jesus was referring to. Leviticus chapter 14, you'll read and we'll read a few verses there. Now, the book of Leviticus is one of those books that if you're really needing to go to sleep at night, you would want to read Leviticus, all right? Also, it helps if you read the genealogies. Those will do it to you every single time. But in this case, Leviticus has some great information that will help us understand what Jesus was saying to the leper and some beautiful pictures to illustrate what Jesus was talking about when he healed the leper. Now, let's look at Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. Hey, that's what happened in Luke. He was cleansed. So this is supposed to happen on this day. For he shall be brought to the priest. And the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed, two living clean birds. We'll stop right there. Notice a couple of things. In the very first few verses I read, the person who is so importantly involved, the person whose name shows up repetitively, is the priest right there. He shall be brought to the priest, and yet not brought into the quarters of the priest. The man shall be brought outside of the camp of Israel, and he shall remain on that outside. The priest shall go to him. That was in verse 3. Notice the priest shall examine. He'll look him over. He'll look from head to toe at every sword, every wound to see if it's there. There are certain criteria he would, he would use according to the Old Testament law. And then the priest, once he declares and realizes he's totally cleansed, he'll tell him, this is what you do next. Notice how much the leper has done at this point. Let me show you how much he's done at this point. It's this much. The leper would just stood there. He was brought by someone else. He was brought there. The priest went out to him, just like the Lord Jesus, goes outside of the camp, outside, so that he might deal with our sin as he was crucified outside of the city of Jerusalem. It says that in the New Testament. In other words, the leper can do nothing. The priest has to do everything. So many men and women will tell me, you know, I know I'm not perfect, but don't you think God would be happy with the fact that I've raised four children, that they're all going, doing well, none of them are evil, none of them are criminals? I was going door to door one time in Jefferson City, Missouri, and I remember I stopped at a door and I, I knocked, and this gentleman, older gentleman, came to the door, and I said, how are you, sir? We're from the Jefferson City Bible Chapel, and we're out visiting friends and neighbors today, just making a greeting, and uh, 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 we would like to give you a, a small gift. Uh, there's no donation involved. It's just a gift to you from the church. 
and, uh, and, uh, and we uh, just wanted to, to bless your day that way. In, in fact, uh, do you happen to have any interest in spiritual things? And he answered something like, well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I do go to church and all. I said, well, if you were to die tonight and ended up at the gates of heaven and God would ask you, why should I let you in? What would you say? And this is what he said. He said, well, you know, I've lived a very good life. Thank you. I've raised four smart, very moral girls. They've gone on to be very productive people in society. I have never missed a church meeting in 20 years. I have given to the church every time the offering is passed. I have given and given and given. I've helped build the library at the church. And he told me about 20 things that he did. You see, he was thinking that he could do something to actually be cleansed of his sin and, and go to heaven. And many people think that same way. Maybe that's you tonight. Maybe that's what you think, that, you know, I may not be the best, but I am not the worst. And certainly my, my, my better parts will outweigh my more uh, disreputable parts. And God will see that the scales are really in my favor. And you know, if you believe that, I hate to tell you this, but if you believe that, you're being lied to. The Bible never says that. It never has says that, said that, and it never will say that. The Bible says it this way, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scales of God are already tipped against you. And many a man will, and woman will, will just run from that and they'll I, I just do it. There's something I must be able to do. You can't do anything. You can't do enough. That's startling news for many a person. Many of us hate to say it because I don't care who you are. We always want to do something to show that perhaps there is a reason why you should rule in my favor. Even when we, we, we give gifts to people, they, they, they think they need to give something back. When another time we were going door to door in, in um, Kansas City, and, I, and we were just passing out Bibles at Christmas time, and I went to a door, and, and, I, had, and I showed him a Bible. I was going to give it to him, and the guy said, oh, oh, just a minute. And he ran inside, and he ran to the door, and he opened his wallet, which was quite big, I might add, and he was taking out these dollars, and I said, no, 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 no. It's a gift. Oh, no, I need to give you something. No, no, there's nothing you should do. God's message of salvation is free, so is this book. Here you go. You see that? We all feel that. In, the, uh, in this case, the priest did everything. He came to the leper outside of the camp. Now, the next thing that happened was these instructions about how the leper was to be clean and cleansed. In other words, there, there was the provisions that were needed. And what were those provisions? Well, I put them up here. You can see that there was two clean birds. They were both alive initially. There was cedar wood, right? There is scarlet, which is thread, a red thread, right, right here. And there's hyssop right here, all right. And later on, you'll see there's an earthen vessel and running water. We'll show that on the next slide. So these are the things that God was going to use. And this is the point that Jesus was making to the leper himself. He was saying this, listen, I, there's going to be an object lesson for you. And when you go to, to the priest today, which was probably Caiaphas, you, you'll, you'll take these things, this scarlet thread, the cedar plank, this hyssop, um, two clean birds, probably doves. You'll take an earthen vessel and you'll, you'll, take, you'll find some running water and you're going, to, you're going to go through this process. Now, this is what you should remember, that God has provided all these things for you so that you would be cleansed of your sin. There's many things that need to be provided, many things that need to be given and, and brought to the priest. Christ has provided them all. Christ has, has made sure that there's nothing else to be provided. It's all upon him. Now, what was the procedure? What was the, or the process involved? It's a little complex, so we'll walk through it carefully. And the first thing that, that you were supposed to do, or the priest was supposed to do, was that he was to take of the birds... And one of the birds, and although this sounds very, very against our animal rights people, what you're supposed to do is take one of the birds and, and take its life over an earthen vessel, 
which was done over running water. Now, this earthen vessel is interesting. I put up here a little pot. It's actually one of the ones you would see in Israel today. And the idea that, that there is it says it's an earthen vessel. It's, a, it's something you made out of clay, out of the dirt of the ground. Now, let me ask you, if you know your Bibles, what, were we, what, what does the Bible say human beings were made out of? The dust of the ground, right? Do you see it? In other words, he's saying there's a humanity involved in this particular picture. And that's very much like the Lord Jesus. It says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says in Hebrews, I won't, I won't have you turn there, but it says this, that he became like his brethren. What does that mean? That means that he put on flesh and bone. The very stuff that you're made of, he put on. He became an, an earthen vessel. And this is part of the picture. Now you take this bird and over an er, or in an earthen vessel over running water. Now what's this running water thing? Well, in the Bible, it talks about water being a picture, a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, what's the Holy Spirit? Is that some kind of weirdo thing we see on TV? No. What it is, is God in spirit form, that is God in a, 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 in a manner that, that moves the purposes of God forward because he executes them through life and through, through your existence, God in action. He's saying that, that it says in the Bible that the spirit of God descended upon the Lord Jesus when the Lord Jesus was baptized and Jesus then began his ministry of healing the sick and, and helping the, uh, 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 making the blind see and healing the lepers and, and, and feeding the 5,000. In other words, God was in action, as it were, and powerful action at that. And so there's a sense that the Spirit of God, like this running water, was in the Lord Jesus who took on the form of an earthen vessel, a human body. And what happened? Well, this is what happened. This, this beautiful bird here was, had its life sacrificed over, or in this earthen vessel with the running water, and that's depicting, of course, the blood of Jesus that was shed. It says in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, that his... his Blood was shed for our forgiveness of sins. And this, is, this process here is telling us about the Savior. And when the Lord Jesus told that, uh, that leper, he said, now you go and you follow this process. You take the earthen vessel and you, front, you have the running water and you have the hyssop and you have the, the cedar plank and you have the dove. You take that one and this would all have been perhaps refreshed in his mind. He's telling him how he can be clean spiritually, not just physically. And Many a person cannot figure out how to be cleansed spiritually today. They try to do it through physical means, but they can't have a conscience that's clear. They're guilt-ridden. And it's a wonder because the Lord Jesus does something that will take away your guilt. He will cleanse your conscience from sin. And there's no better deal than that on the planet, let me tell you. And so you take this bird over uh, or in an earthen vessel, over running water. You shed its blood like the blood of Christ was shed on the cross for your sins. As you and I both know, it says that it was literally shed. And the spear that was driven into his side uh, gushed forth water and blood. Isn't that interesting? And you get the idea that he's almost a, a very clear sort of reference to this passage as the Lord Jesus had told the leper to follow. Now, what was the other part of the procedure? The other part of the procedure was also interesting. You take the living bird, the second one. He shall take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop. So you got this, this, scarlet, and the living bird. And you take them all four together and you dip them in the blood of the bird that lost its life, uh, that was killed over running water. Now, this is an artist's picture of what that might look like. Here's the cedar wood right here. There's the living bird. There's the scarlet thread. There's the hyssop. 
and there's the blood of the bird that lost its life. That's very interesting. It's very gruesome in one sense, and you think, wow, this is kind of crazy. But the truth is, is that this is another picture. God is good at using object lessons for us. And what does it all mean? Now, this is some of the things that I think it means. The seed, and according to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 33, it talks about how the, the uh, cedar is a, the cedars of Lebanon. Those are majestic trees of that era or that area of the world, uh, strong and, and towering trees that were used to build the temple, used for noble purposes. The hyssop in the same verse is talked about as a weed that grows out of a well. In other words, whether you're mighty or you're weak or, 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 or just a weed, you need to be covered in the blood of Jesus, don't you? You see, I meet a lot of intellectual people. That's where I was raised with all the, the education that I had to endure and a lot of smart people out there, and they're arrogant people because this, they, they deny God and they mock God. One fellow mocked the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He's now passed away, but last time I checked, God's still alive. And here's the, here's the thing, whether you think you're great in your mind, in your intellect, in your money, in your power, in your influence, in your respect, in your political prowess, or you're the most obscure and despicable individual, you're just a weed that gets trampled under people's feet, everyone is touched by leprosy. Everyone will be touched by death. It is the great equalizer of all humanity, and if you are that person that thinks you have much to brag about, much to proclaim, then I want you to know you need the blood of Christ in your life tonight. And if you're a person that feels like I'm such a tiny person, no one would know, or I'm the worst of people, no one would care, let me tell you, you still need the blood of Christ. Isn't that the story of Simon uh, the Pharisee, where he thought he was the well-to-do, very moral person, and he looked down on the immoral uh, woman at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus said both of them couldn't pay their debt. They were both unable to pay, and the debtor, or the creditor forgave them both. Jesus is the creditor. He would have all people come. Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight in your spiritual journey? Some of you have come a long way, and you're very good at what you do and highly respected in your field but you do not have Jesus Christ in your life. I'm telling you, both are needed. Both ends of the society, spectrum of society need the Savior. Now, it says here that you have scarlet thread. Now, what does that scarlet thread mean? Well, there's a verse that is tucked in the book of Isaiah. You're familiar to it. Uh, it goes like this, though your sins be a scarlet. In other words, though your sins are that deep dyed kind of red of, of the scarlet thread, though they're like that, I will cover it in my own blood. You're both the plank and the hyssop with the scarlet are touched by sin. Now, what you do is the process was, of course, you take the first bird, you sacrifice its life in the earthen vessel like the Lord Jesus in the body of humanity with the Spirit of God upon his life directing him to do so. And then you take this, the benefactor of this, the second bird, you show whether they're mighty or whether they're lowly, sin touches all and all need to be covered by the blood of a substitute. And the process is meant to be, uh, lead to a pronouncement. And here's the pronouncement. You take this, 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 this um, uh, oops, I don't know what, to, oh. You take this here, the bird and the plank and the hyssop and the blood, and you then sprinkle it on the leper. And it says here, you sprinkle it seven times. Seven means it's perfect, it's, it's complete, it's done. And you put it on this, this person with leprosy, and then you can say, you are clean. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does in your life. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ under his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, 
and he, you come under that and you recognize that He has died on the cross for your sins. He took your place. He, he, he suffered as the criminal that you are. He suffered as the one judged as you should be judged. And the pronouncement is that you are clean, and yet you didn't pay for your sins. The Lord Jesus did. Did you know that's kind of the story that goes behind the Barabbas fellow in the New Testament? Do you remember Barabbas? Barabbas, he was the worst of the three, wasn't he? He was supposed to be crucified that day. It says that he committed murder, he, he uh, was, a, was a thief, a, a, a robber, and he led in rebellion against the state of Rome. Whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish, he was despised by all people. And in that moment when the Lord Jesus, who was totally innocent, as the Romans realized, as actually uh, uh, the religious right realized, and even the prisoners realized, he took the place of a prisoner. He was made to be a criminal when he wasn't. And the real criminal, Barabbas, was let go. This is what's happening. When you come to the Lord Jesus, he, his blood, his sacrifice, his uh, payment for your sins now makes you uh, free of your sin, and he becomes that sin for you. He becomes the criminal for you. And that's exactly what would, be, what would have been the inference of the, of the story that he, the Lord Jesus told the leper to go do. Follow this law. Now, when that happens, the high priest turns and he says, you are clean. He shall be clean from his leprosy like a soul is clean from sin. And then what it says here, look at this. He shall let the living bird go off in flight. So undo the living bird from the, from the plank of cedar wood. Uh, get rid of the hyssop. Take that bird and take him, it says, into an open field and you let it go. Now what does that mean? That means that that bird lives under the blood of another. You see the picture? That bird lives. And that's exactly what happens when you come with, 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 with the Lord Jesus. He, he bore our sins, went into the grave, and as, as, as astounding as it may sound, he rose again. There are some 500 eyewitnesses to this effect. He rose again from the dead released, as it were, with new life into the open field of eternity. And that's exactly what happens to you when you are joined with Christ, when you recognize His sacrifice, taking your, His place on the cross for your sins. You have new life. You are released into the open field of eternity to be with the Lord Jesus forever. It doesn't get any better than that, believe it or not. Now listen. I want you to read these verses with me tonight. I, I have them on a few extra slides. I want you to see that it says this, uh, and, and this concerns the whole idea. The whole idea of the blood, of being under the blood. Look at this. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a red heifer, those are all um, uh, sacrifices of the Old Testament, like this bird thing when it deals with leprosy and the sprinkling of the unclean. That actually, that actually is referring to this bird right here. Sanctifies for the purifying, of the purifying of the flesh. If these practices of the Old Testament would make a leper clean and allow him to be declared religiously acceptable to come to the festivals and to the occasion, Occasions of making sacrifices, how much more, how much more the blood of Jesus Christ, who through the eternal spirit, the water that's flowing, offered himself without spot to God. He had no sin. You see, how can a leper cleanse another leper? You can't. You got your own mess to worry about. But if you had someone who was without leprosy, now he has the strength and the legitimate resume to make a leper clean. And that's exactly what Jesus was. He was without his own sin so he could bear your sin. And look, cleanse your conscience from dead works. Oh, listen, there are so many souls today that are aching under a conscience that screams at them because of their sin. They cannot seem to shake it. They go left and they go right. They come to me. I, they ask me for medications. They do all that kind of stuff. And their heart is weighted down with guilt because you can't take a pill to get rid of your guilt. 
The only person, the only thing that will take away your, your guilt is the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you that way today? Are you suffering in this manner and you just can't, you wish you could just get rid of those thoughts of sins that you've done, the abortions that you've had, or the, the drugs that you've used, or the, the offenses that you've made, the things you've stolen, or the relationships that you have partaken. And you just, oh, those sins haunt you and you can't get away and you try to drink more so it'll numb your pain. Oh, listen, you'll never escape guilt like that. The only way that you can escape it is through Jesus Christ. Read it. Cleanse your conscience from dead works. That's sin. Are you there today? Do you need your conscience cleansed from dead works? Well, let's end with this one tonight because I told you that this bird was released in flight like a bird having new life, as it were. And this is where it comes from in the New Testament. He was delivered up because of our offenses. That's the Lord Jesus was put on the cross because of our sins. He was raised. That's resurrection. He was given new life because he satisfactorily paid for our sin. It's very similar to the person who was put in jail for, for a stealing. And after he's been in jail for his appropriate period of time, he's released from prison. And we, and we say, hey, I thought you're in jail, my friend. He says, no, I've paid my time. And the fact that I'm released shows that my sentence is complete. And that's exactly the Lord Jesus. He was raised from the dead showing the sentence of death was completed. Number two, he did this once at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It wasn't some other object. It wasn't another bird or an animal. The Bible says it was the Lord Jesus himself he did this. And finally... When that happens, something unique is done to death. Death no longer has its sting. Death no longer has its power. Because the, the, the strength of, uh, of death or sin leads to death, and death therefore has a power over every human being. Leprosy leads everybody to death, uh, the, sin, the, the sin that leprosy represents. And when Christ comes, he takes away that sin and allows you to be released in new life, joining him. And now we can say together, death is swallowed up in victory like the flight of the bird covered in the blood of another. Oh, death, where is your sting? Tonight, are you fearing the sting of death? Maybe tonight you have lost a loved one and the sting of death haunts you. Because you're afraid that if you were to die tonight, you have no hope. You have no, no security. I'm here to tell you tonight that your hope and security is in Jesus Christ. Be covered in the blood of the Savior who washed away your sins by the sacrifice of his life for you and his resurrection. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus was showing that man that day. All of these things, he said, you go fulfill, you go fulfill the law and, and go to the priest. You go fulfill that. And this is, that, that action of obedience comes out of Leviticus 14, and it displays in beautiful pictorial form that there is a substitute for that man, a substitute that would cover his sin and take away, like, like, just as Jesus took away his leprosy, and now would let him fly free away from sin, away from guilt, away from a conscience that would nag him for all of his life. And he could live an abundant life in Jesus Christ. Is that you tonight? Because let me tell you, if it is, there is no need to wait. There is no need for you to, to put this, this understanding off. Quit trying to make it on your own. How successful has that been for you? I'm sad to say it's probably most unsuccessful. Your conscience is still bothered. If you're in that position tonight, I want you to know the invitation of God stands. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe you need rest from your guilty conscience tonight. Maybe you need rest from a sin-plagued life that has haunted you night and day. You can't sleep, you can't eat, because your life needs 
to be cleansed. Let me tell you something. God loves that kind of person. That's the kind of person God reached out in Jesus Christ and touched him. To let him know the heart of God would reach out of heaven to touch the diseased sinner of humanity. Is that you tonight? Won't you let Christ touch your heart? Why are you putting this off? It's no longer time. The only time left is for you to receive Christ as Savior. Let's bow our heads. As I've talked tonight, and maybe as you will be listening to this message later on, you might be at a point where you want to come to Christ, just as I've invited you. There's nothing magical about it. There's no magic words. There's no creed you're supposed to cite. But I'll tell you what, what is important. It's your faith in what I just described. That's all it is. Perhaps if you're at that point, you would say this. My God, I understand. I'm that leper. I'm diseased with sin, and I've tried to fix my life, and I can't. And I, 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 I give up. I give up. I beg you, O oh God, fix me of my sin. Take it away. My conscience is killing me. My guilt is overwhelming me. Oh, God, I need you to take away my sin like Jesus did on the cross for me that day. Oh, God, I come. If you're willing, you can make me clean. I know you're willing. I receive what you have done. Father, tonight, we've come to a very important point. And it's a point where the Spirit of God must now continue and uh, what He's already been doing, and that's the work of the gospel in men and women's lives. And many of us who know this, oh, may it refresh our souls to such a degree that we rejoice in the great Savior that He is and that we cannot keep our mouths shut of the wonderful redemption done in Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's a soul tonight that is right on the edge of eternity and wondering exactly about what I should do, I pray, nudge them forward to the things of the cross. For you're not willing that any soul should perish, but every single one would change their mind about Jesus Christ and repent. In Jesus' name.